All right. So, hello, everybody. Everybody, literally and spiritually. So, I'm Jason Wolf, which is the Hellenic Wolf. Uh, my name is Jason, which means uh, healer in uh, ancient Greek. It's uh, actually Iason, comes from Iasonas, uh, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, if you know mythology. And um, I host in- interviews, I host basically interesting conversations with uh, people around the world or around the flat or triangle world, whatever you like to believe about it around the water and outdoors training. These are my two uh, things that I'm a little bit passionate about, I would say, um, since a young boy. And um, today, I think we have a very, very, very interesting uh, guest and maybe a friend of mine, as it seems to be, uh, probably a mentor to me and will be probably a mentor to a few of you too at some point. So uh, I want to welcome uh, Hans. Hello, my friend. Hi, Jason. And what a nice intro. <laughs> I didn't expect you to say that. Mentor. Wow. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be your friend. That's That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Don't be humble. <laughs> I can see... <laughs> I just say this because uh, I all I talked with you before uh, off record, and you know sometimes you can see people they know some things, they care, and they can just share the knowledge. And for me, there is uh, the mentorship goes both ways. At some point, uh, sometimes people uh, the student becomes a teacher even for a minute, and then it, it's a beautiful relationship where everybody is learning, and um, yeah, we put egos aside and we learn. We learn how to be better humans. So thank you for coming again. Thank you for uh, uh, in- investing your time here and um, no time to waste. How about if you can actually just start talking, which is, I think, <laughs> it's the only way we can go with you because I think if you just start talking and I'll let you go, I think everybody will be happy here. So well, you can present yourself, introduce yourself, and yeah. uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm very grateful that we met, by uh, by the way. Um, my name is Hans Schokkenbroek. Uh, I'm a Dutchman. Uh, I was born in Algiers, uh, in Africa. My father uh, traveled all over the world, at least Africa... Middle East, um, even uh, in uh, Indonesia, so the Far East. I'm a petroleum engineer by trade. I did a technical university in Delft. Uh, So I came from a very rational point of view. And something happened to me, uh, well, I'm not sure. It's probably 14 years ago now. But... um, that made me look at life a little bit differently. Um, Question to you, Jason. Um, How do we learn best? Through pain, I guess. Ah, Yeah, well, that was my lesson, definitely. Um, I think uh, you learn through experience. Um, And um, in my case, uh, for what I'm doing now, which is working with water primarily, um i had to experience the pain of loss uh, of our first child after a week she was just born and that was one of the first instances in my life where i really understood what is important in life and uh, you know it has nothing to do with matter it has nothing to do with having a nice car and a fancy job um for me it now is about it's about love and it's about um, health. It's for you and your relations. And you can take relations as far as you want. Um, you know, some people see their relations as their family. I nowadays see uh, relations as the entire universe. Um, and um, funnily enough, um, you know, you learn when you are in pain, when you are experiencing bad things that's when you truly learn Uh, it wasn't enough for me um it 
uh, it took a few more lessons. Um, we uh, had trouble getting kids, and um, eventually Jasper was born, my current son, uh, and he turned out to have Down syndrome, which was uh, well, you know, at the time, uh, both the loss of Daphna of our first child and Jasper were very traumatic um and it was another lesson in uh, what is important i'm actually and this sounds strange to some people but i'm actually very grateful now that i lost my first child uh, because i am the person that i am through those bad experiences and they were bad when i you know when i had them um and eventually that was not enough uh, i actually also got into a business uh, situation where they didn't want to uh, turn out the shares that they had promised to me. And that was truly um, devastating to me. They were the people that I trusted most. Uh, yeah, I had long standing uh, relationships with them. And that was actually the, the final lesson where I finally, uh, I was really literally the victim. And that, uh, that pulled me uh, to a situation where I was, truly suffering and that's where someone said to me you know I can see you being victimized um, would you like to do this course and I went like what do you mean this course and um, that was my first experience with whatever you want to call it uh, um, different consciousness uh, spirituality to me actually spirituality means everything it means matter and it means the the world that we cannot see, the non-ordinary uh, reality. Everything is spiritual uh, for me. And um, I, yeah, uh, he, I literally asked, uh, can I, uh, what is this course about? And he said, uh, is there, a, um, can I read a book about it? Because I, I really wanted to rationalize everything still. And uh, he said, yeah, there's, Two books about them. they're actually in this uh, in my uh, library here, uh, and I read those and I thought, well, you know, uh, having lived across the globe, um, having been exposed to a lot of cultures, um, two thirds of this world, I think roughly, believe in reincarnation. In Holland, we're taught that it that's not possible, but I always was open to, you know. If two thirds of the world think that it is uh, there, then why, who am I to argue with that? So I was always open for these things. Um, my father uh, worked for Shell, and we went to all sorts of places. Uh, I saw the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, at the time, I was playing golf at at the foot of the of the pyramid, <laughs> totally unaware of uh, what pyramids are all about. Um, but it, it, it always, yeah, I always kept an open mind. I mean, literally the pyramids. If you truly think that they were built with people, Egyptians that only had copper hammers, you know, think again. <laughs> it's like, come on. Exactly, we, can't, yeah, yeah. we can't even build them now. So anyway, uh, so I, you know, there were lots of things in that book that I thought, oh, okay. I'll, uh, yeah, that's that, that sort of uh, resonates. So... I went to this course, which was a two-day course, how to remember to feel. And I was like, how to remember to feel? <laughs> what is this? Uh, and uh, I said, okay, I'll go on Saturday because on Sunday I have to play golf. It was a two-day course. And I actually did only go on Saturday. Um, and in that course, um, the um, it was literally about trying to feel the ceiling, trying to feel the table, trying to feel the glass. And I paid, you know, money for it. And I thought, okay, open mind, open mind. And at some point, um, the um, the guy that asked me uh, actually said, uh, "Well, um, pick a, pick a traumatic moment." I just want to switch off my uh, my email here because you may hear that. Sorry about that. No worries. So. Um, I said, well, that's not very difficult. That's that's the loss of our first child. So, uh, and he said, okay, well, close your eyes. Um, 
do you see the moment? Uh, and I picked the moment that we actually went back to the hospital uh, and she just died. So um, so I said, yeah, okay, I'll close my, close my eyes. And he said, okay, open your eyes, focus on that lamp. And it sort of went back and forth like 30 times maybe. And, um, and then suddenly, uh, the only way I can uh, describe it is that I had this um, energy surge starting from my feet and it went straight through my heart. I burst into tears and I felt, whoosh, I felt something coming out of my crown. And there I was, a petroleum engineer, rational, uh, with a relatively open mind, but I experienced something that I could not rationally explain. And that's the moment that uh, where I thought, okay, I don't understand this, but I need to know. I need to know. And that sort of pulled me into the path where um, I started to listen to my feelings. I started to, well, I literally dropped everything I did. Uh, I did stay in that job for, for a while, but uh, I eventually even walked away from that job. Uh, and I just started following my heart. Um, and it's only later that I found out that that's what the Native Americans do and all the tribes do. They, they just follow their heart. They follow their feeling. And that led me on a long path, a very long path, because I wanted to understand everything, know everything. So I looked into history. I looked into the medical industry. I looked in all sorts of things. And eventually, um, I ended up with water. Um, Nowadays, I am in a business called uh, Dragonfly Water Solutions, together with a, with a partner of mine, Peter, very special person. In the, um, and um, our main focus is actually water, uh, because I found out that, you know, water is not, uh, if you ask someone, if I ask you, well, you know more about it now, but, um, you know, if you ask the general person, what is water? What's the answer you get? It's, you know, it's mostly, water. yeah, H2O, H2O. A chemical, yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, it's actually very interesting. Uh, Peter uses this a lot. Um, it's very interesting that water actually, the H is a gas and O2 is a gas. So that, how can that be a fluid? It's, <laughs> you know, that simple fact is already like, okay, never thought about that. And then you find that there is all types of water. Uh, like you know, uh, if you uh, read uh, the, the work of uh, Gerald Pollock, who was a scientist, um, and he found out that there's something called H3O2, and H3O2 sits on every every surface that is uh, hydrophilic, that uh, uh, attracts water, and our cells are probably 70% H3O2. It's a different type of water. It's a fourth phase of water. I never learned that at school. Uh, nobody told me about that. So, um, you know, I started, yeah, uh, delving into the world of water. And I found that, um, well, actually, I don't do anything in the sense that uh, when you start listening to your heart, I call it spirit these days. And, um, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, but I, I try to indeed get out of the way. Uh, you know, you used the term, um, you know, leave your ego. Actually, if you go to the Inca uh, wisdom, then uh, I kind of like that. They say, no, no, you have to make your ego humongous. You have to make it as big as the universe. Because if you make it as big as the universe, then you are basically part of the universe. Uh, and I, I kind of like that. Because uh, you need your ego. Uh, in order to be here um, and it uh, I started you know the more I listened to my heart the more I was pulled toward water and uh, that's what we do we uh, we use natural technologies um, because if you start looking at nature um, there is so many things that are mind-blowing uh, that we're not being taught um, and uh, you know to me, to cut a long story short, water is a is a is a living entity. It's actually Victor Schauberger, who is a forester, um, an Austrian forester. He was 
born, I think, 1895, something like that. And he actually, a lot of this wisdom comes from him. And he was able to observe Mother Nature in a way that nobody had done. And uh, I, le I later uh, actually understood that the way that he found his knowledge was actually by connecting his consciousness to water. He would literally sit high up in the mountains next to a stream and he would he would just connect with the water and water told him most of what he knows. Uh, and to me, water is indeed a living entity. Victor Schauberger called water Mother Earth's firstborn. And it's kind of logic. I mean, if you think that all life on Earth um, depends on water, so maybe water is alive, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and amazingly, if you go into it with an open mind, you will find that there's a lot of evidence um, that water is actually alive. Um, you know, the work of Emoto, uh, a Japanese scientist who, uh, I got a few books. I mean, yeah. the, you know, simply by freezing water and by making photographs of the crystals, you find that um, most tap water in all big cities is generally makes no crystals or hardly any crystals. And if, if so, then it's ugly crystals. But then the interesting thing comes that if you put it into a, a glass of water and you start being nice to the water, and I think that's actually the, the old, um, the prayer that we all, you know, we all, most of us grew up uh, religious. And, you know, we used to pray before we, we, we ate. And I think that's why it actually was, the function of it is to be grateful for your water, be grateful for your food, and then the properties of that water changes. And you can demonstrate that by freezing it. And it's the same water uh, that you just you know got out of your tap, but by simply being grateful and giving it love, you change the water and you can see it because if you photograph the crystals, they're much more beautiful. And I think this is actually, uh, this one is a very powerful one. That's a crystal that uh, comes from love and gratitude. Uh, and that's just one of the scientists. I mean, there's, there's, there's many other scientists, uh, many other people working on it. Uh, Vida Austin, lovely lady who, uh, who actually uh, started uh, developing a method where you put water into a petri, into a petri dish and you put an intention on it, or you put the water on a picture or you know, whatever. And amazingly, if you start freezing that, you will find that whatever you were thinking about or whatever it is seeing, it is reflected in the crystals. So, you know, maybe water listens to us. And, and this is where I know, actually, Peter and I keep on saying that we don't know anything. And what we mean with that is that this is indeed what you try to say, leave your ego uh, at the door. <laughs> um, I try to just not be in the way of what I'm getting through my inner guidance. So, um, and in that theory, actually all the wisdom is already there because we're all connected uh, energetically. So all the wisdom and all the past and all the future are, are already here. It's just a matter of connecting to what I now call spirit. So, um, yeah, in general, um, what we try to do is use natural technologies. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, natural technologies actually are simple. Mother Nature is, I call it simplex. The principles are extremely simple, uh, but the expression of modern nature is incredibly complex. But um, ultimately, um, what I found through the work of mainly Victor Schauberger is that, to me, um, the Mother Earth uses two basic motions. And the one motion is to break up life, to recycle, 
matter. Um, and the other one is to build up life and to create uh, an, uh, a noble life. And the first motion, the, the recycling motion, is the inside to out spiral. It goes from inside to out. It leads to chaos. It um, is an explosion. Explosion already you know, tells you you're actually literally ripping something apart. So you're breaking it up. Uh, and that motion is connected to noise. You hear it. It is connected to increasing friction. The harder you make the motion, the harder you will get friction. Uh, but interestingly, is that is what Mother Nature uses to recycle. Interestingly enough, all our methods of energy generation are actually using that method. They're using an explosive force. You can call it a wrong motion because <laughs> it's actually the, the motion that Mother Nature uses to degrade something. And if, I mean, Schauberger literally said, I didn't know this, but the word technology, and uh, people see, think that we have improved tremendously in technology, and that's true. But technology, I think in the old Greek, techno comes, uh, actually means uh, self uh, delusion. It means self delusion. Um, and where, personally, I think where humanity has gone, we have gone up in technology, but we've actually, as a result, because we're using the wrong motion, uh, the degrading motion, we have gone down in our uh, uh, consciousness. Um, and that's over you know, hundreds of years. Now, the other motion, the upbuilding motion of Mother Nature, is the outside to in vortex. It's, it's an implosion, and it's uh, accompanied by cooling. It's accompanied by silence. You don't hear your blood. You don't hear sap in the tree. Um, and it's the harder you make that motion, the harder you get attracted. It actually works on attraction. And this is how we actually met, you know, um, through a mutual friend of ours, Mark. And Mark was visiting a water shop in Berlin. It's the oldest water shop in Berlin where we have one of our uh, products. And Mark invited me into his life. And that's how we eventually ended up. Um, so that motion outside to in vortex is actually used to my amazement by all things that are that we call alive. Uh, sap in plants, sap in trees. It flows in a vortex. It flows in a repeating vortex, and our blood flows in the same way. I was absolutely astonished. Didn't know that, and you can find it actually. You can you actually find it. So, the interesting thing that's what Mother Nature uses to bring forth life, to ennoble things, to make things better. And the motto of Victor Schauberger was comprehend and copy Mother Nature. So, understand it and then copy it. It's really simple. Mother Nature doesn't use electricity, not in the form that we use it, by the way. Um, Mother Nature doesn't use, doesn't need maintenance, and Mother Nature certainly doesn't need chemicals. So the true natural technologies have that same characteristic. So this, and it's amazing, but if you force water or any liquid or any gas, doesn't really matter, to go into a vortex, you actually improve the characteristics, and it's just amazing. Uh, chemically, nothing changes. Chemically, you will see the same thing come in and the same thing go out. But the characteristics are changed. And that's where science goes completely like, uh, that, that can't be. And it's logic, uh, because chemically nothing's changed and we only think in terms of chemical. And, um, but you can show that what so-called vitalized water or restructured water, there's certain, you know, there's many terms for it, um, but you can show that it actually has a different characteristic indirectly. You can see that plants, if you feed that water to plants, they grow faster, they grow stronger, 
uh, and they will actually last longer when you harvest them. And the same goes for animals and humans. Uh, it's not a quick fix, by the way. You know, if you start drinking this sort of water, to me, vitalized water, restructured water, it's the basis of your uh, immune system. It's the basis of your health. But if you sit on the couch all day uh, and you eat hamburgers and watch uh, TV all day, um, then, you know, it's not going to do much. Um, and that's actually one of the um, difficulties with the people that are into this business where they, there's many people that make so-called vitalizers. Uh, you know, and they say, well, you know, you'll never get ill. But that's, you know, you need to be careful with that. But the amazing thing is, with a very simple apparatus, you just mimic Mother Nature and you improve life tremendously. So for us, um, water is actually you know, the best place to be um, in order to, if you, if, you, if you are able to balance what I now call the sacred flowing waters, um, then, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, and we were both, Peter and I were both led. So that's the main thing that we do with Dragonfly. And, and we don't care um, who actually, what sort of uh, vitalizers we use. Everything we do is based on our feelings. Um, and it's really <laughs> difficult at first, where you try to shut down your mind, because um, your mind's like a monkey. It, it just keeps on chattering. Um, and it's hard to learn to listen to your heart. And your heart is actually telling you you go left or you go right. So we choose what we do on the basis of what we feel. And how do you know that's right? Well, <laughs> through experience. You know, this goes all the way back to how do you learn? You, you learn through experience. And that's, you know, it takes time. It takes time to, uh, to learn. Um, but for me, personally, this is absolute truth. Uh, and we've now come to the stage where we have such confidence in, in, you know, basically letting go and listening and waiting on the invitations. How do you run a business based on just being invited? Well, it is possible. <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually proving it to ourselves. We don't need to prove it to anybody else. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, a long intro, <laughs> but that's essentially what we do. Um, we have various um, uh, apparatus uh, that we sell, but we sell only by invitation. Again, that's a, <laughs> that's a paradox, um, but that's what, that's what we do generally. I'm impressed again. Um, it's interesting to hear you talking uh, many 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 questions many many things that i'm invited to ask now um so where do i start all right so let's start from the last thing you said about invitation let's let me give you also my experience about this and uh, probably reinforce this fact of life uh, over the past uh, year and a half probably two years i'm I have this channel i'm uh, slowly but surely getting more focused with this and uh, more honest with my heart on where i should go with it and the more open i'm i'm becoming with my uh focus with my heart where my heart leads me what should i talk about what's my best interest about this and i leave outside all the you know the rationale and the business advice and all that stuff Whenever I do that, whenever I listen to the heart, I'm getting invited into some fantastic people, people's lives, people's experiences, and meetings with people who, funny enough, they are willing to help grow this channel slowly but surely without I'm, me pushing anything. Like, literally, I'm pushing nothing. I'm just here. Uh, I'm eager. I have enthusiasm about water. Um, I'm, and I'm, the more I listen, and I think mo most people, sh you know, should try that. Like, I don't think if you can try, um, probably you should just not try. Probably that's the right attitude, in a sense, in a sense. 
uh, in my experience. But this um, this flow, this uh, truth, this uh, not fake conversation we have now is what I'm all about. And I think uh, there are a lot of quote unquote secrets when we behave that, that way we behave with our heart first and with the mind second because i have a few friends for example hans that they are very smart guys in the intellectual iq way very smart guys probably this sm- one of the smart some of the smartest in greece for sure i mean and their results show it, like first in their class they get like uh, honors blah here here there very smart guys but I've seen time and time again for the past like decade that I know these guys that they fail with their relationships. At least they have mediocre people around them. Um, they don't have the girl they, they want really, and they complain to me on side. So they, it's just I don't know. It's it's full brain, no heart, and it leads them to a lot of distress. And whenever I did that, because I myself I'm intellectual also. I'm not a physical guy, although, you know, I mean, we have the body, but whenever I put the brain first, I always find myself trapped in four walls in my mind. And I'm like, okay, now what? And I'm trying to find sometimes another advice and another advice and another concept and another method and another system. But at the end of the day, you can go and find a hundred systems and a hundred methods, but if you don't open the heart based from what I experienced the past two years, which are profound to me, and I guess you had some similar uh, visualize, not visualization, some lessons like mine, um, yeah, the heart has to play a role, and the whole feelings don't matter mantra. Have you heard that, Hans? Feelings uh, don't matter. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. yeah it sounds so idiotic to me now. Like... <sighs> I don't know. So I, I, what I want to say, bottom line, whatever you said, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. you know, it's like um, what I I find English is fascinating language. Actually, it's a, and it's if you look at um, if you look at everything apart from humans, yeah. The Native Americans call this your relations. Everything is a relation. You have a relationship with the chair you're sitting on. You have a relationship with your microphone. You have a relationship with everything. And they're all, in their opinion, they are all alive. And if you think of it, we're all energy. Where everything in the universe is energy. Um, actually, since Einstein, I think Einstein was... Uh, was one of the people that actually said, well, the ether does not exist. I I was amazed. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, I often ask this. It's like only 3% of the universe is actually matter. That's the stuff that, you know, that, that's that's what we're, we're made of. Um, so the 97% of the universe is actually ignored. Um, and it's, but it's there. And if you go into the native tribes, it uh, doesn't matter where you go. They, they all recognize that, that that's actually the source of everything. Um, um, so from that perspective, we actually, uh, we are in the Western world, we're only willing to look at, at the result of the underlying source. We're only looking at, um, yeah, not at the cause. And as a consequence, we sort of miss the big picture. Um, and by the way, you know, everyone is entitled to their opinion. And that's one other thing that I love about the Native American uh, traditions is that um, where initially, if you, you know, stuff like I found out and you go like, wow, there's a lot more to this and water is, I should tell everybody, because if you drink this water, then you will be more healthy. So you have a, a an inkling to help people. Well, um when I came back, actually, from the from that course, where the uh, actually the trauma of the loss of my child uh, came out of my body, I wanted to go to my wife first thing because that trauma is like a hundred t- times bigger. I wanted to help her. When I came home, uh, she didn't react in the way that I wanted or that I thought. She wasn't at all grateful, and um, and it took me a while to learn 
that you should just basically respect everything and everybody. Uh, just give it love and um, don't try to help. It's hard because that's what makes me happy is the main thing why I do things that I do is because I want to help. Because I found that the only true way of finding happiness is actually by helping others. That's, that's if I really boil it down, that's what makes me happy. Uh, but, and then we go back to the invitation, it's only when you are invited to help someone that you can help someone. And it was very, it was a very difficult lesson. It still is sometimes because if you see people, you know, suffering, or you see people with a certain illness where you think that you have some knowledge to offer or some help, it's difficult not to make that step unless you're invited. Um, so you know that's 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 a yeah that's a big part of being. And that's where I come full circle. So if you look at all, everything on earth just is. You know, a stone just is. A table just is. The spider that I just saw earlier here just is. The only beings on earth that have trouble with being, most of them are acting, actually. <laughs> they are pretending to be something else than they are. They are not authentic in who they are. And it's hard because the system tries to make you, you know, the same as everybody else. Uh, the system tries to make you non-authentic. Uh, so you get taught in that manner. But the only beings on earth are humans that are actually not able to just be, to just, you know, be here and not worry about tomorrow. Don't get mad about yesterday, about what Jason did to me yesterday. Um, we have trouble because we have these minds. And the mind is like a monkey. It just keeps on chattering away and it keeps on. And it's interesting to, I found out that there's a biological reason for it. Why we all, almost constantly act out of fear. It's because we have a reptilian brainstem that acts out of fear. And if you're not conscious about that, then you're not conscious that you're actually constantly acting out of fear. People who want to control things are actually not being able of letting go of that. It's a fear-based action. So it's so difficult for humans, in my experience, to just be. But it's incredible if you manage. It's like... To me, heaven and hell are right here on earth. It's just a choice. And, you know, I tend to choose heaven. I kind of prefer that over hell. Uh, and the more Peter and I find that we let go, that we don't want to control, that we don't worry about tomorrow. I mean, it's crazy. We don't even have a business plan. You know, <laughs> it's like, which business? And, and we're both, I mean, I'm, I used to work for Shell. Uh, and, and Peter has done all sorts of stuff. So we're very trained in making business plans and all that. But, you know, you write a business plan and the next minute it's already out of date. It's totally, it's, and it's amazing that there's a, everybody works on this manner, in this manner. That's and crazy. it's the same, you know, when, when you introduced, um, you know, when we talked shortly before this interview and you said, well, let's just let it flow. Well, that's exactly how I think everything should be done. You don't have to make a presentation. If you, if I, if I go to the um, to the minister, if if I get invited by the minister uh, tomorrow, then I won't go prepared. I'll just be there. Uh, Hans, I have to I have to congratulate uh, uh, congratulate you on making me hyper happy in this moment because i'll tell you and this is a very small parenthesis but again reinforcing everything you say the statement this truth guys so for anybody listening anybody who's interested in public speaking i've done it successfully for the past 10 years 
I've done public speaking in front of hundreds of people. I've organized humongous parties on the beach side. I've done political speeches in front of tens of people. I've presented ideas, startups. I presented in front of NGOs. I had an NGO with my friend. We grew it to tens of uh, team members and hundreds of uh, volunteers. So I have a small experience about public speaking. Now, it was always interesting to me how I was never, and maybe you don't want to follow my advice or Hans, Hans's advice, I was never prepared about anything, like literally anything. And I always had guilt because anybody, everybody around me said, and I went to Toastmasters you know, to see where I am, and everybody would say, you know, have some, uh, blah, blah, like, don't go unprepared. You know, you have to prepare, study, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, I was literally, and I'm not bragging, it was a fact, in Toastmasters and whenever a public speaking event was upcoming in the NGO and a speaker was needed, I was a guy. I was choosing to be the guy because I was never prepared, but I was always flowing. Of course, I wasn't always perfect. You know, I sometimes I was losing my track, but I always made it fun if needed. I always corrected my mistake with human fun. Okay, that's fun. Let's continue now. Like, bring us back to the flow. No need to stress. There, was, there wasn't there was any real stress because I was focusing on the people. I was working on the audience, my people. I was considering everybody my people. Maybe it was not my people, but I was seeing the people in the eyes in the front row and I was considering, okay, I'm, uh, I'm so, fuck, I'm, I'm not cursing. I'm so proud to be here <laughs> And to connect, not to, I wasn't an authority in my mind. I was nothing. I was like connecting. And it was so interesting. And I was interested in what I was talking about, which is another thing, by the way. If you want to be a good public speaking, don't talk about things that you're not interested or connected about. <laughs> that's at least that's what I did. I was always talking about things I was interested about. And that's why I always were in projects that I was interested about. And it was super easy. And everybody was saying, oh, my God, you are such a big talent in public speaking, in PR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, back to them, like, no, I'm not. I'm not a talent. I couldn't speak when I was a teenager. Literally, I had no, almost no friends. Um, I just realized something when I was 19, that everybody is connected and everybody's afraid. And the only thing you have to do is just care about the others and talk about what your heart is talking, what your heart wants. So whatever you said, I mean, you just reinforce, uh, maybe it's wrong, maybe it's, uh, it's it's good, but it just, Hans, you reinforced me and everybody who's listening wants to get into public speaking, just keep that in mind, what Hans uh, told us today. So thank you, Hans. Thank you for this uh, fact. Well, no, no problem. And again, you know, it's, it's I fully agree with what you said is that, you know, if you just let go, um, and again, it's hard because you, 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 people that are not conscious about how they are operating at a biological level, um, if they're not aware that you are actually automatically shoot into fear-based mode, into survival mode, actually, um, then, you know, it's, it's hard not to do that. Um, it's, yeah. But it's it is so liberating. It is so incredibly. Um, you know, how, how do we? If you look at our school system, and you compare it to the native um, way of teaching, it's the same thing. It's uh, in our school system. You know, you have to do math, and and you go like, what do I need math for? And I don't like math. Um, you're forced to do things. You're forced to learn. Um, a certain pattern but they never look at they never look at who you are whereas if you go uh, in a native in, in a tribal situation you know little little johnny is like four or five years old he doesn't speak well if that's the case in in holland or in the western world then you know yeah you, you go to a doctor or you go oh something's wrong but there they actually focus on what does little Johnny like? What does he like? What do you like to do? 
And, you know, okay, Johnny likes, like, he's very interested in fish. Well, just ask the fishermen to take him. And so they actually look at, and they do that with the elders and with the parents. Uh, the elders are the, the people that the tribe says, okay, you have so much knowledge that the knowledge has turned into wisdom. So you're not only, you have only, not only knowledge, but you also use it wisely. And they get asked to become an elder by the tribe, to help the tribe with their wisdom. And, um, you know, they, they, they observe the children and they look at what does the child like? What are his, they call it medicine. What is its medicine or her medicine? What are the unique characteristics? And they enhance those because that whatever makes you happy, you're going to be good at it. You're going to be good at it. It's exactly what you said. It's exactly what you said. So the trick in being happy and in balance is, um, and that's to my amazement, that's exactly what tribal tradition is all about, is that they, I mean, I use the body quite a bit nowadays. Um, it's like, if my body represents the universe, um, and it's like I'm a, let's just call it the pinky, although it probably would be just 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 one cell. Yeah, I'm the pinky, and 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 you're the thumb. Uh, interesting. The interesting about this metaphor is that actually, yeah, we seem different. Yeah, you know? I'm a pinky and you're the thumb. We are definitely not the same. That's what you think. And you actually have a very different function. But we all know that if the pinky doesn't work, then the body's got a real problem. And if the thumb doesn't work. So it is important in, uh, and that's what they teach in, in native uh, tribal uh, traditions, is to find out who am I? What am I in this universe? What is my unique medicine? What is my function? Oh, I'm the pinky. Now, once you know that, once you know your medicine, then all you need to do, all you need to do is just be the pinky. I don't need to change Jason, the thumb. I don't need to be busy with Joe Biden, who's, who, who may be my big toe, you know. All I need to do is respect everything, respect the rest of the body, because if any part of the body doesn't work, we have a problem. And just be me. You don't have to worry about it. And it took me a long while, this one, actually, <laughs> Jason. It took me a long while. But it's so liberating. Because that's all you need to do in life. And this is, again, where you know, people watch television and they get, they get upset uh, from what they see. And I want to change it. Well... To me, the only way that you can change the world is by literally being the best pinky that I can be. And that's all I need to do. And yes, the world will change because if, if the pinky is in 100% uh, condition, then the body has an issue less. Um, so, And it's all about just being. But you need to know what am I? Who am I? And that comes from what makes me happy. What makes me happy? And just do it. Uh, and I would advise, you know, that's actually, yeah, uh, I think there's so many people out there that are not in balance, that they, are, they have stress. And it's all got to do with logical thinking. It's all got to do with, yeah, but I need to earn money. I need to have a house. I need to do this. So I'll stick with this job because I've got this job. I don't want to lose it. And it's actually preventing them from finding happiness. Um, I actually played golf yesterday with uh, a person um, who was financially very well off. And um, we have mutual friends uh, who, are, who are extremely rich. And he told me that at, at, at one point he was sitting at a table with these guys. I mean, these guys are good for hundreds of millions. And he said, uh, he told me the story. He said, I said, guys, you know, how many millions do you need? <laughs> what do you need in life? Now, obviously, um, you know, having luxury is fine. I mean, I love luxury. I love, I love a good meal. I love, I love 
you know, playing golf. And um, so I enjoy luxury, but what do you really need? And he literally asked the guys, he said, why are you going for the next 10 million? You know, you already have 200. And they both looked at him and said, oh, we never thought about it that, that way. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And you see people, you know, trying to amass more matter. But matter actually, uh, I think in a way, really uh, takes hold of you because the more matter you have, the more you want to protect it. And at the end of the day, if you look into matter, there's nothing there. It's an illusion. It's literally an illusion. Because we're now able to go into molecules and we go into atoms and you find that it's 99.9999999% nothingness. It's an illusion. Yeah. And, you know, some people find out, some people don't. That's all fine. But I think... Uh, yeah, the way to balance and happiness is by just being yourself. And um, I'm actually very much into the Hopi tradition. Um, don't ask me how this all happened. <laughs> I don't think there's anything like a coincidence. So you know, I was I was basically brought there, um, and I now have a teacher, a grandmother in the Hopi tradition. And it's tremendously, yeah, humbling. Um, and they literally teach you um, to be humble, uh, to respect everything. I still learn every day from her. I'm, I'm, I'm just her student. And, uh, but the way to balance is to, yeah, just, just find out who you are and just be it and you know have fun life is here life is here to enjoy yeah. i agree i agree i agree completely um yeah many people think life is just suffering i've heard you know many people in our 2020s uh you know the whole hustle and uh you know suffer culture i uh, call them hustle and suffer uh, which are the guys that are doing the hyper marathons every week and they have to do the extreme physical and they have to go through pain and i respect part of it but at the same time there has to be a balance you know hans what uh, the ancient greek have a say it's called um metron ariston which more or less means that uh, the balance uh, excellence is in the balance um you go one way too much doesn't lead in a great way you go to pleasure too much again you figure very fast that you are probably into drugs now and now you are dependent so uh, it's both ways and uh this is one of my favorite two words like metro narison i always keep it in my mind metro narison i'll probably tattoo it at some point but you know, find the balance, you know, find, find the balance. It's not suffering. Like, I, I don't like the whole dude who, who, who tells, you know, go wake up at 4 a.m., uh, lose sleep uh, to be a man, and then go and run and do weightlifting. I, I mean, yeah, do it in a healthy way, balance it out. But <laughs> I see them. I mean, Hans, what you said about the guys, the hyper millionaires i have a um, i have a friend here who is who in a previous life was also a millionaire a multi-millionaire and he has connections with a billionaire too a multi-billionaire actually so and he you know he shares his uh, views his experience his stories and i see the same exact story like uh, when you go too much in one way then matter is your master and uh, it's funny that master matter kind of the same um so yeah i i mean at the, at the same time going the other way again uh be completely indifferent about life or about growing or about uh, creating um you know that can also lead to some issues so yeah i love everything you said about this so 
interesting about the tradition that they have and uh it makes sense it, uh, it makes sense well it brings you a balance brings you back to to water actually uh, you know that's um actually my um i found out that in the hopi tradition they um actually in most old uh, traditions um if you look at history you know our history is well, it doesn't take much to find that there's all sorts of gaps in there. Uh, and interestingly enough, in the in the old tribal traditions, you actually see they say that we actually are once you know once every while the world actually resets. And the last time in their view uh, that the world reset was the great floods of Noah. It's, uh, if you you will find all over the world that. Um, all these traditions uh, mention the great floods. Um, and there's something to be said. Again, everybody needs to do their own uh, investigation, their own, find their own truth. Um, but there's something to be said that actually our history is very different to what we're being taught and um, that um, the world resets every once in a while with a big, big occasion. And... Um, in the tradition is actually we're now uh, moving into another great uh, transformation. I would say it's it's uh, interestingly the word uh, uh, apocalypse. Um, actually, people with that word think of disasters and because of all the movies, but it's it's actually got a very different meaning. Um, it's uh, a revelation. Um, I think is the proper trans uh, the proper translation. Yeah, so, apocalypse. It's it's a Greek yeah. word. It's calypse means the cover, and you remove the cover. So, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, and in the Hopi tradition, we're actually uh, now moving into a new transformation. The world is about to change, and you can see uh, it. I think if you want to. Uh, because the world's in shambles, the world's get becoming more and more chaotic, but it's just part of the process. And it's not something negative, it, it can be something very positive. Um, and then uh, I found that um, in the Hopi tradition, they said that the only way that this transformation actually can go in a good way is by balancing the sacred flowing waters. So bringing water back into balance, because we are assuming that water is alive uh, and again i can only speak for myself uh, i truly believe that that is the case and and you know like schauberger schauberger actually said a lot of the stuff that is happening now if you read his books he was already predicting this because we're using the wrong motions uh because we're mishandling water uh because what we do with water water maintains its vitality uh, you can see, you know, in the spring, the water comes out high in the mountain and it starts whirling and swirling. And, and that's how it keeps its vitality. Um, life is movement. Everything that is alive moves. So water needs to keep moving in order to keep fit, in order to keep vital. And what happens? What do we do to water? We put it into straight pipelines and we make it stationary so literally water loses its vitality and and that's part of the story uh, but it's uh, this is what vitalizers do uh, they actually revitalize the water they actually bring the characteristics from water back from what it's supposed to be like spring water um, it goes to almost dead water um with certain characteristics around it which are to me extremely interesting um there's 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 two effects one is that the water literally starts dying because it loses its vitality but the other thing is what is the information that the water contains um and interestingly for me the way homeopathic medicine works and you know there's still some people doubt it, but um, 
there is a you know there's a big market for it and it works and i actually found out that i can now logically explain at least for me <laughs> uh how it works uh, have you ever been asked at school what are the main determining factors of the characteristics of matter what determines what matter is have you ever had that question well i don't remember it's been a time hans well so i don't remember you. either and neither did i get that question at university and what is interesting is that what i now and you know my grandmother always says hans knows nothing so, <laughs> so all i know all i know is that i I know I don't know. With a lot of these things, I know I don't know. Uh, with with the more I the more I learn, the more I know that I don't know, and it's fine. You know, you just let go. Anyway, the way I now explain how homeopathic medicine works is that you have this 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 um, this piece of matter which is a has healing uh, capabilities like a curcumin or a cannabis, and you put it into a fluid. And you shake, and then you you dilute, and you shake again, and you dilute, and you shake again, and you dilute so much that it's physically impossible to find that matter. You can't find any any uh, um, curcumin or whatever you put into it, and yet the fluid has more than double, I think, the benefits of when you first put the curcumin in now what happens in the way i understand it is that the main characteristics of matter are determined by not by composition but by how molecules are arranged now in a matter uh, in a solid that is actually a structure but in a fluid that's an organization. And so what happens with homeopathic medicine is that they, how, I don't know. I mean, this is quantum physics. I, I really don't know. But for some reason, if you start shaking, it actually the shaking helps to transform, to, um, to enable the, the information transfer better. But basically, the information from the curcumin is, is actually somehow being transmitted to the fluid and the molecules start reorganizing themselves and they literally take over the characteristics of the curcumin and um, if you look at uh, diamond versus uh, graphite you know diamond is the hardest thing we have on earth and graphite sits in your sits in your pencil it's 100 percent c12 it's 100 percent the same thing so the only thing that i can see that changes is that is the, is, is the structure. And now comes the interesting thing. Peter is a bit more careful with this uh, than I am, but I literally tell people that what we drink out of, uh, out of the tap, in Holland, we are told we have great water, great water. And it's actually fairly clean. That means there are a few uh, solids in there, although there still are. There's lots of, I mean, if you boil down a big pan of water, you will find that there's also stuff that if you boil it all down, you will find lots of stuff in your in your clean water. But we actually, our tap water in Holland goes into the sewer. And in, in the sewer, it there meets everything you don't want to know about, you know, antibiotics, chemicals, uh, shit. <laughs> uh, so, and what happens there is that the water takes on the properties of all that stuff that it needs. And so literally, if you then take out the solids mostly, they say you have great water, but you don't. It's actually water with terrible information, and that's the water that you drink. Do you die earlier? I think so, yes. Do you notice? No. It's the same with radioactive uh, uh, stuff. You know, you yeah. don't notice it. You have people have your immune system is amazing but yeah i'm absolutely convinced that uh, yeah people are going to die earlier because they drink wrong water and that comes back to um yeah our mission 
uh, and that's by you know trying to bring vitalized water uh, as much as we can out to the world because um, that's yeah that's the best way that I think we can help yeah yeah that sounds like a great mission Hans actually uh, that's why the channel will uh, keep focusing on the water uh, movement and water in my opinion um, I like both that's why I'm focusing on just these two because many people in our day are focused on supplements and doing that and doing this and food yeah okay these are very important things of course uh, part of the deal but uh, two things that I've seen making a huge difference in my life lately uh, I mean the past year and always were something of interest to me was actually move move correctly move often do things around movements explore movements that you never explored uh rotational movements which it's like for the vortex that you talked about um move, move the fluids inside you so again back to the fluids and it's movement and water so these are my this this is a channel uh, going forward and uh these are so important and yet most people don't do them well or at all they either move in two directions uh or and they drink tap water and as an engineer myself i was studying engineer hans i don't know if i told you about but i was studying as a civil engineer uh in the highest university here in greece uh, engineering school in athens and i was actually and that's another reason that i continue with water i took um you know, when you are an engineer around the third or the fourth, I think the third, around the third or fourth year, you take um, a specific thing you want to specialize. Like you can be a bridge dude. You can actually yeah. make bridges. You can make uh, anti-seismic things. You can go about the roads. You can make uh, foundations. You can make sky, everything. I took uh, water, man. I, I took underwater uh, things, constructions around water, everything about water. So now it dawns me that 10 years ago, I chose water and there was a reason probably about it. I love the biology of it. I love to be near the nature. I always loved water. It was mystery. And I learned there about the sewage system, about the cleaning water uh, systems. And I we had a a complete lesson we six months we devoted ourselves into how that works where that is in greece in athens and how that water you know with all the chemicals supposedly is cleaned out and it never made sense to me like it never made sense to me uh, i never trusted since then I, I was like oh really i wonder if people knew how we drink water from tap water if they would continue to drink it like um, and then you go into information water and people get informed here and that's another mission your mission i would love to expand your mission and people like you to expand because you you search about water and about the spiritual aspect of it and the quantum mechanics of it which we don't know but we can actually see the results of it i think so it's very interesting hans yeah no i actually uh on the I, I didn't know that you were a structural uh, engineer, but it's interesting, like um, Schauberger, uh, the forester. I mean, uh, this is one of, this is a good book about him. Um, it's by uh, Jane, I think, yeah, Jane Goddard. Because um, Schauberger himself actually, um, because he realized that there is a exchange between, a constant exchange between the source, which is the higher energy, uh, which is the 97% of the universe that scientists uh, call that dark energy and dark matter, but we literally sort of, uh, you know, we don't measure uh, anything but the matter, which is the 3%. Uh, Schauberger actually showed and realized that there is a continuous exchange between the high energy source and the expression of that, which is matter. And Truly amazing. I mean, there's stuff like, um, and I'll get back to the structural uh, uh, engineering, but he, you know, if you think about it, a mountain stream, uh, a mountain spring, right? It's a small trickle. It's just a small trickle of water. Well, 
if you go like 10 yards downstream or 20 yards downstream, the water volume has quadrupled. It doesn't come from the sides. It's literally, and actually Schauberger, if you go into Wikipedia, he, he is called a quasi-scientist, simply because people don't understand what he was talking about. But he literally, he has proven all these things, is that the water volume grows. Water actually starts literally eating minerals because it's looking for minerals, and it grows in volume. It's not like it's coming from the sides. It's actually growing. And in fact, you know, even the tides that we have, he has all sorts of different mechanisms. Mm. And so what he's saying is that um, literally there's a constant exchange between matter that gets transformed into higher energy or other energy. And then that energy is used to form matter again. And that's what happens with a log which you put into the fire. The matter disappears, it turns into energy, and that energy is then very used by Mother Nature to create new matter, new life. Even dew, uh, according to Schauberger, dew is not condensed water, it's newly formed matter, which is actually why it's so nice to walk with your bare feet on dew, because it's, it's very high energy. And it, you know, this, you know, people that hear this, <laughs> They go like, what? <laughs> that can't be. But there's so many things that um, that Schauberger worked on. And uh, what triggered me is that Schauberger, for instance, argued that you should, for the Rhine, because you know, he, he, he lived in Austria, and you have the Rhine running all the way down. It end, ends up uh, here in my country, totally uh, polluted, totally drained from his life. But... Um, engineers, water engineers, try to manage rivers on the outside. And Schauberger argues that you're, you're actually throwing your, you're literally, sorry for the word, but you're pissing away money. You're throwing away money. The only way that you can control a river, which is a, river, which is a living entity, is actually by increasing the vitality. And you do that on the inside of the river. Mm -hmm. uh, again, go within. Go, go within for your answers. And he showed that if you do that properly, the river will not actually go outside its banks. It will not do that. It's amazing stuff. Uh, the nice thing is that all this stuff, all this knowledge is actually becoming available. And, and more and more uh, people are open to, okay, well, let's try this. And it's literally... By doing it, you will get the experience and you will get the proof. Um, so, you know, that's an interesting part. It really is. Uh, and it's exciting because uh, I think, you know, if you look at consciousness 20 years ago, uh, who, whoever did, you know, there were very few people doing yoga. There were very few people talking about consciousness. So this, this is all part, for me, the sign of the times. Um, and this is literally the time to because we're in this transformation um it's up to us to do the work it's up to us to change this world and the fun part of it you just have to be you just have to realize who you are and you just have to follow your heart and in my case it's water in your case it's partly water which is great uh and it's really interesting isn't it i don't believe there is a, such a thing as a coincidence if you look back in through your life if I would look back at my life, I, mean, I literally saw the pyramids through my father's work. I, I saw great parts of Africa. I saw Turkey. I mean, Turkey with all the ruins. And uh, I was in the Far East. And you can see, ah, you don't always see it. But if you look back, you go like, ah, oh, that's, that, that's why that happened. And it's, for me, very comforting to think in terms of what I call spirit, if you just let your feeling, if you let spirit guide you, everything happens for a good reason. Even if it might seem um, a bad accident or something negative, it usually happens um, because it has to make room for something else. And that's, if you start looking at what happens around you from that sort of point of view, where you just go like, okay, 
why is that happening? Not seeing it as a negative thing, but seeing it as a as a as a, as a learning um, experience, and it becomes very, yeah, almost easy. Isn't easy for my wife, by the way. She's still getting used to <laughs> to <laughs> to my changes, but there again, you know, I had to. In any relationship you you have, you have to you know, you can only um, work on your side of the relationship, and you can only respect and love that side of the relationship that you do not control. Um, I hope your grandmother says that's your sacred space. You know, I am not allowed to touch your sacred space, and if I don't like the relationship I have with you, then I have a choice. You know, I can say. If I don't like it, then I need to walk away. And talking about balance, um, it's not just, you know, this is also very interesting from a tribal point of view is that um, most people are only talking about physical balance, but you have a, you have a physical body, you have a mental body, um, and, and you have an emotional body, and you have a, spiritual body and all these four elements need to be in balance if you're not aware of it then they're going to be out of balance anyway i mean nobody's always in balance that's impossible here but it's becoming aware becoming more conscious about these elements and that's what i'm getting from through these tribal teachings is that you look at your emotions you acknowledge them and then you go on so so you bring them back into balance there's a lot of people because they're not aware that they have an emotional body. I mean, how many people really look at themselves and go like, okay, what you said, I mean, actually that hurt me. It, it hurt my feelings. And they don't tell the other party. Now, nowadays I've learned to, okay, hold on a second. That hurt, it really hurt. So I'll just tell my partner, I said, what you said hurt me. Not to have a discussion not to change her, but just to let her know this is what it does with me. And then we move on. But in that way, you keep your relationship transparent, clear, and in balance. And it's up to her or him or whatever, you know, whatever uh, relationship you have to do or not to do something with what you just said. But it's not about changing someone else. It's just making very clear this is who I am. And... Uh, Grandmother calls that uh, authenticity. Yeah, just being authentic, you, being honest about this is what I think is important. This is how I feel, and just be. Yeah. Wow. I think that's. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a better closing uh, for this uh, experience that we had over the past almost ninety minutes. Is yeah, it already that's... ninety minutes? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we could go for probably five hours. So I'm inviting you for a second, of course, part two at some point. Um, we have a lot to share here. And when I say we, I say probably you. And I'll just uh, <laughs> be no, the... No, no, it's that you know an awful lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I, I appreciate you, Hans. And uh, do you want to share with uh, the people uh, reading, uh, listening to this, uh, where is your website? Your do you have any social media? Do you want to share anything about what you're doing with Dragonfly? Um, yeah, actually, we have a Dragonfly um, Dragonflywater.com. Actually, Dragonflywatersolutions.com. Uh, it's actually there's not much on there. <laughs> we don't. Uh, this is again where we feel that people that are compelled to. Uh, find the website, then they will find the website. Um, but we have several products, as you know. Uh, one of them we are really excited about because it's a uh, um, some of the vitalizers that we have are actually um, they're not cheap, uh, and they are a lot of people have problems with um, acting uh, on the knowledge that if they if they even believe that it's important to drink vitalized water, then it's still a very big step for them to buy a, you know, uh, 
and vitalize and put it on their mains. It's only a once-off payment, by the way, because it'll work for the next for, for the entire life. So we tend to focus outside people more because uh, animals don't have belief systems. Animals just know that this are and they know what water is good for them and plants. Uh, but we do have a, a one a new addition to our products, and that's um, it, it's called the Mayu, M A Y U. You can find it under uh, mayuwater.eu, uh, and that's where Relix. Actually, I've got one here. Um, it's just a it's a carafe, and there's a small whirly thing here in the bottom, and. What it does, it you you place it on a base, and the base makes the the whirler turn, and it creates a vortex within the vase. It's the very first B two C product that we have, and what I really like about it is that the point of uh, where you need vitalized water the most is actually just before you drink it, uh, and this is one that you can put on your table. And the interesting thing is. We were invited almost to, uh, yeah, to bring this product into market, and literally we find that people seeing the vortex, it actually attracts people. We, we, I, yeah, I'm looking for resellers, absolutely, and resellers that feel that they want to resell it, they're happy. Uh, you can actually uh, go go to our website, but it's, um, I almost we have grown very fast and it's purely on attraction and it's just a confirmation of that we are on the right path for us uh, and we're they're lovely people it's actually an, an, uh, an Israeli product um, but if anyone wants to talk to us uh, you know look for uh, dragonflywatersolutions.com our numbers are on there um, we haven't even talked about the kitchen table. Jason, uh, we'll time. do that next time. Yeah, very interesting, by the way. Uh, for anybody listening, I was blown away. I mean, it's so simple of a concept, but very interesting. And uh, such a really a traditional also concept in a way. Uh, so, yeah, next time. Well, actually, sure. Maybe maybe as a, as a closing line, um, that's the core of what we do. Uh, we actually feel that... Uh, we have a kitchen table. We have various kitchen tables. We have uh, we we now have one in uh, Mallorca. We have one in uh, in Portugal and Silves. And uh, the concept is really that at the at the kitchen table, people drop their masks. And uh, so what we're looking for is, is creating as many kitchen tables as we can throughout the world, where you have good energy, you have good food, and people are attracted to it. And from there. We let the energy flow, and actually, the products that we sell are important. But it's like a spin-off of that. It's like uh, the most important thing is that we're looking for kitchen tables. So, if anybody feels uh, compelled to know more about that, give us a call. Excellent. All right, guys. So everything that uh, Hans talked about, I'll put down below any links or anything you can find. Maybe be a little bit more easy for you to find him. And Hans, thank you for coming on. Of course, it was uh, an honor and a pleasure and a great friendship that we're building here. And I think that the, the people uh, listening to this are going to benefit from these conversations because they are going to be many, I think. Uh, I feel probably. That's the right word. <laughs> now I feel, yeah, feelings do matter, guys. Yeah. <laughs> and feelings are do energy, maybe even more. Uh, not even matter, even higher. So um, think again. Please stay for a moment after this recording ends. Um, and uh, anybody else, please, if you liked it, of course, I'm not going to even say it, but if you like something, you support it. And that's the way the heart uh, leads us to connect. So that being said, uh, next time, uh, stay tuned for the second part of this interview. Uh, probably I would say conversation, even better. And uh, see you soon, guys, in the next episode. Ciao, ciao. Thank you very much.